I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. Today I will be discussing methods to assess the quality of large tandem mass spectrometry datasets that use subjective methods that do not directly reference a specific peptide sequence assignment algorithm, but instead depend on the properties of the assigned peptides or their statistical weighting. This type of quality assessment has been made necessary by the large numbers of peptide 2 sequence assignments that are now publicly available. Over the last six years, the number of these assignments has been doubling year over year to the current number of approximately 230 million. To construct useful databases and annotated spectrum libraries from hundreds of millions of such assignments, it is necessary to reliably obtain confidence levels that are 100 to 1000 times greater than would normally be used in a single dataset. The largest number of assignments is for human samples. Mouse, rat, yeast and a number of other model organisms have significant numbers of IDs. To generate a useful annotated library, about 2 million IDs are required. Creating an annotated library takes a considerable amount of effort and a number of individual steps. The step that this talk will address is the second one, assembling spectra from qualified datasets. Specifically, how to recognize a suitable dataset by objective methods. These three general categories of methods will be addressed by providing individual examples of each. The examples are not meant to be an exhaustive list. There are many other possibilities for using the general approaches typified by the examples chosen. The first example uses a prediction that can be made using expectation values to determine the fraction of identifications that are non-random. As you can see from this table, if you simply deal with stochastic IDs, then the number of IDs in a range of expectation values will decrease proportionally as the range of expectation values decreases. Breaking the E-value ranges into decades, and dividing the number of IDs in each decade by the first one, N0, leads to a ratio that decreases proportionally for each decade. Taking the base 10 log of this ratio produces a prediction that can be easily graphed over a wide range of E values. We refer to this base 10 log of the ratio as the row value. This graph is a real dataset analyzed so that no true IDs were allowed. The red points indicate the real row values obtained, plotted against the log E prediction. The black diagonal line is what would be expected for purely stochastic IDs. The degree of agreement is surprisingly good. This graph uses the same data, but allowing a small number of true IDs to be available to the search algorithm. It is clear that below an E value of minus 2, the experimental red points have shifted away from the black diagonal prediction. This shift indicates that for E values less than minus 2, the number of true IDs is larger than the number of stochastic IDs in that range. In this final graph, all of the true IDs have been allowed. The curve now leaves the diagonal below an E value of minus 1, indicating that for most of the displayed range there are significantly more true IDs than stochastic ones. Now we will discuss a few physical parameters that can be used to assess data quality. If we have an assigned peptide sequence, it is easy to calculate its canonical charge by simply counting the number of basic side chains and adding one for the end terminus. Dividing the measured ion charge by the canonical charge gives us a zeta value for each ID. In this example, the parent ion charge is measured to be 2, and the canonical charge of the assigned peptide sequence is 2, so the zeta for this ID is 1. Yes, there is a question. Does the N stand for N-terminus or for asparagine? It is an N-terminal asparagine. It probably was not the best choice for this example. Thanks for pointing that out. This graph shows the frequency distribution of observed zeta values in a real experiment. In practice, this distribution is characteristic of an iron source and should only vary when peptide sequences have been selected by some type of sample preparation or chemical treatment. This distribution is for purely stochastic sequence assignments. The pattern has clearly shifted towards charge states other than the canonical prediction. 
there is also merit in studying the distribution of the mass difference delta between the measured parent iron mass and the assigned peptide sequence mass. Genuine assignments generally follow a different distribution than stochastic ones. This graph shows the distribution of mass differences for a real data set obtained on an Orbi trap instrument, in which no true assignments were allowed. Note that the distribution is at least half a Dalton wide. When true assignments are allowed, the distribution is reduced to only 5 parts per million wide. By plotting any new identifications caused by a change in the details of a search algorithm, it is a simple matter to determine if these new points are part of the true distribution or the stochastic one. Amino acid analysis of the identified proteins and peptides can be a very valuable tool in understanding a dataset. AAA can be calculated in a number of different ways, giving, for example, the composition of the proteins or peptides identified. It can also be performed on specific positions on the protein or peptide relative to the enzymatic cleavage site. The most effective way to use AAA information is through a spreadsheet, but it is hard to properly present that type of information in a talk. However, there are peptide properties that can be calculated from the AAA information, which can be readily plotted. This diagram shows the PI and chromatographic retention of each peptide in a real dataset, with each peptide plotted as a dot. The larger the dot, the more confident the ID and illustrates that the peptides found in proteomics most have low PIs, corresponding to the enrichment of acidic residues caused by triptych cleavage and MSMS measurements. A more striking enrichment is seen when titanium oxide, or other anion exchange material, is used to enrich phosphopeptides. Yes, you have a question. Is the shift to lower PIs caused by the phospho groups on the peptides, which are much more acidic than the organic carboxyls normally found on a peptide? No. The phosphorylation is not considered in the calculation. Only the primary sequence of the peptide is used. This plot illustrates what would be expected from the trips in digest of a yeast, whole cell, lysate. The pattern is very similar to the first slide, which was a C. elegans whole worm lizard. This plot should be the same as the previous one, it is also a yeast lysate, but taken by another group. Notice that there is a significant problem with the chromatography, short retention peptides were not observed. It is our experience that this type of problem is a very significant cause of variability in proteomics, particularly when run-to-run -run consistency is the goal. The last topic I will be discussing is how to use previous observations to gauge the merit of a new one. Since we have multiple observations of many proteins and their peptides, you can simply see how any particular peptide ranks in a list of sequences already ID'd for that protein. This is the list of peptides for the human protein, catalase. A simple statistic that can be used to represent this ranking can be calculated by first counting up how many total peptide IDs exist for that protein. With that total, you can easily calculate a frequency of observation for each individual peptide. This new frequency can be tabulated for each protein in the proteome, allowing the prediction of how likely it is for any individual peptide will be found in a new experiment. Plotting out the tabulated data, one can see that for this protein, there is no single peptide that dominates the collective data. Instead there is a gradual decrease in frequency over the range of the top 20 peptides shown. Using these numbers, you can calculate a sum of frequencies, omega, for any real protein ID, which has a minimum of 0 and a maximum of 1. Tabulating these protein omega values gives a good indication of how well a new observation agrees with all previous observations for that protein. I would like to thank you all very much for coming. The session chair says that I'm out of time, so we can deal with any further questions during the coffee break. Thanks again.